Welcome everyone to Half History Will Travel. I am your host, the Wilder Historian, and since I covered the opening shots of the Battle of Gettysburg and the fight for McPherson's Ridge in animated battle map form, I thought I would round out the first day's fighting with the fight for Barlow's Knoll and the Brickyard fight. Please consider joining the Patreon to help support the channel and get to vote on these animated battle maps as well as statehood videos. Thank you to all the patrons who have supported me thus far. It has been a wonderful help. As Robert Rhodes' division pressed the Union Army from the northwest and the divisions of Dorsey Pender and Harry Heath attacked from the west, a fight also broke out north of town with a portion of Rhodes' division and the arriving division of Jubal Early. Since Major General John Reynolds had been killed earlier in the day, Major General Oliver Otis Howard, the 11th Corps commander, now took command of Union forces on the field. He sent the division of Francis Barlow and Schnofsky's brigade north of town to secure the Union line defending Oak Ridge. They were placed just north of town and in front of them sat a Confederate skirmish line atop a knoll, soon to be known as Barlow's Knoll. Behind the skirmish line was the brigade of Brigadier General George P. Doles. Barlow saw the knoll as pivotal and ordered a heavy skirmish line to be thrown out in front of his brigades. Then, with Von Gilsa's brigade providing support, they pressed onto the knoll and easily seized it from the Confederate occupiers. But this action garnered attention from Dole's brigade and Early's division, which was coming down the Harrisburg Road. When Barlow saw the brigades of John B. Gordon and Harry Hayes along with their artillery, he called up for four guns to be brought up to the front to combat the rebel artillery that could easily cause destruction in the Union ranks. The 25th Ohio was then called on to support the artillery, but the vision of thousands of gray troops streaming down the road in front of him and Dole's brigade preparing for an assault from the northwest convinced Barlow to move the rest of Ames' brigade to the knoll. The Georgians were closing in on the Union position and advanced to within 50 paces of one another and fired volleys into each other's ranks. The lines were so close that the flag bearers from the 25th Ohio and the 31st Georgia fought one another with their own flag staffs. Canister from the Union gunners had ripped holes in the Confederate line as they passed over Rock Creek, but despite the casualties, Gordon urged his troops forward. Confederate artillery created havoc in the Union lines as well. The commander of Barlow's artillery, Lieutenant Wilkinson, was an early casualty when an artillery shell severed his leg below the knee. The young officer cut away the remnants of his limb with his pocket knife, but died later that day from shock and loss of blood. The brigade of Von Gilsa gave way first, leaving Ames' brigade to deal with the rebels who were advancing closer. Ames ordered the 75th Ohio to fix bayonets and charge the approaching rebels, but instead, they advanced, and because they could easily get overwhelmed by the sheer numbers of the enemy, they halted and fired into them. As the Georgians swarmed over the knoll, the 17th Connecticut launched a bayonet charge, but it did little to stymie the rebel onslaught. The pressure was too great for the Union soldiers, and they began to fall back in great haste. General Barlow would be horribly wounded, left for dead, and captured by Confederate forces. The rebels captured the knoll, but were not content with just holding that feature. They were pressing onward toward the town. Shinovsky's brigade moved across the Carlisle Road. The 21st Georgia saw their movement and detached itself from the rest of the brigade to engage the Union forces not knowing exactly how large the Union force was. Once across the road, they turned north, and when the Georgians realized they were in over their heads, they fired one volley, then pulled back a little ways to wait for the enemy to approach them. The 21st Georgia hunkered down while the rest of Dole's brigade and Gordon's brigade moved toward the Federals, but the two batteries of artillery on the west side of the Carlisle Road let loose enfilading fire into the Confederate ranks, bringing death and destruction with every blast. The left of Dole's line and Gordon's brigade overlapped the 26th Wisconsin and sent the Badgers and the 75th Pennsylvania running for the rear. The Ohioans and New Yorkers fought on for a little while longer with the Georgians, but it was all in vain. They had to fall back as well. Brigadier General Shomifanig, acting 3rd Division Commander of the 11th Corps, had already sent the 82nd Illinois to support the Union on the left, but now sent the 157th New York across the open fields to hopefully help the Union troops streaming back toward the town. However, they couldn't see the 21st and 12th Georgia regiments concealed behind the landscape, and like a swarm of bees, the Confederate regiments formed a semicircle around the New Yorkers. Confederate artillery on Oak Hill hit the New Yorkers from the rear as well. The men that could retreat did so, but the attack came at a terrible cost. The 157th suffered 75% casualties, with 27 killed, 166 wounded, 
and 114 captured or missing. Around the same time, Rhodes Division and Pender's Division broke through the Union lines and the Blue Troops began streaming through the town. Early had Gordon's men take a rest, but advanced Hayes and Avery's brigades toward the town. Colonel Charles Coster's brigade was sent to hold off the approaching rebels, and they took up a position in a brickyard. As soon as Avery and Hayes came into view, the Union soldiers began firing their rifled muskets into the gray lines, but the numerical superiority of Early's two brigades engulfed the blue line. On the right, the 134th New York received enfilading fire from the 57th North Carolina, and they became the first regiment to fall back. Next, the Louisianians, under Hayes, outflanked the Pennsylvanians on the left, which forced Coster to order them to retreat. The 154th New York in the center did not hear the order and held out a little longer, until the rebels charged into their midst and took a great many prisoners. With the defeat of the 11th Corps north of town, the Confederate victory on July 1st was sealed. The Federal troops retreated to a series of hills to the south of town and began fortifying those positions. During the evening and night, brigade after brigade, regiment after regiment from each respective army made their way to the battlefield. Confederate General Robert E. Lee and Union General George Meade began to draw up their battle plans for the next day.